Okay, so hey buddies. Hey buddies. Hey, buddies. Welcome to another Comics Clap Trap Zoom edition. I'm glad to see your guys' faces again. Um we're excited tonight because and I think the the guys are super excited too because you get to talk about super superhero comics. Cause I like superhero comics. I actually do like superhero comics. I don't know much about issues and certain things, but I would I'm excited to be educated on on Jack Kirby because our guest tonight is Tom Scioli, who is an Eisner nominated cartoonist. He's based in my hometown, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, he's done some amazing comic book series like, remember American Barbarian? You guys remember that? <laughs> and um, he's done the Fantastic Four Grand Design. Um, so, you know, there's no question that um, Tom has a strong enthusiasm for um, the next, like the topic of the, his latest book, which is um, a biography about, of um, Jack Kirby, who's just, you know, the legendary comic artist, um, co-creator of Marvel. DC superheroes, Captain America, Iron Man, you guys, your favorite heroes. Um, so his latest book is Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. Um, so we're excited. So welcome to the program, Tom Scioli. Hey. 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 I, thought, I thought that was amazing. There was a little fade in there, That's I thought. Amazing. Did you see that? Did you see that transition? There was a little he fade also, in. He also gave us a little delay, which was, which was even Oh, like, is that what that was? Like, even more <laughs> mouth-watering, and then he appeared, and it was like, whoa. It was an internet disconnect. Very dramatic. Um, yeah, but we're super excited to have you on the show, and um, this is kind of a different um, thing for us because we – hardly talk about superhero comics although outside of the show we those guys um tin and josh talk about it a lot they're collectors they like know the history are you i think i mean you but, collect but some... we're not talking about superhero comics really we're yeah. talking about a biography <laughs> of a cartoonist right but i'm seeing the enthusiasm for you know a, like a legend in Marvel i mean and i DC mean that, that is, is being why... talked about in this book and so like i feel like the enthusiasm of that the whole world I mean, okay go, go for go for you guys <laughs> well you know that that's why i, I think tom is uh, like uh, out of all the cartoonists that that i've ever, we've kind of known or, or seen around in the shows like i'm more jealous of tom than anybody you know because <laughs> why because because you you um he, he he's able to do these superhero stuff or like kind of mainstreamy stuff that you yeah. always dream about doing when you were a kid but in a like kind of indie fashion it makes like, it cool. You can just describe Tom's art in, in any way that is just like mainstream DC Marvel at all. You know what I mean? But yeah. you're able to do the stuff that like everybody dreams of doing your way, which is like something that I think a lot of us indie guys or like a lot of us alternative car comics people get to do. So I'm excited to talk to you about that aspect of your uh, your comic stuff. Yeah, I mean that 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 was kind of like the the hard way into like mainstream comics is like the way I went. Like it, yeah, it took yeah. a really long time and like, you know, it, it, I wouldn't recommend it as like, you know, <laughs> have to go, if that's like your aspiration, this isn't the way to do it, you know? Could, could I, well, I'm sorry to already hijack the conversation so no, fast. Do. Could you tell us a little bit about how some of these projects came about? Like yeah. I, when you came out with G.I. Joe's versus Transformers, I was livid. I was so mad because I was like, <laughs> I want to do that. That is my project. You know, that's the project. Like, if you look on my desk right here, uh, uh, there's all these Transformers and there's all these G.I. Joes. And, like, all I ever wanted was, since I was a kid was to do, you know, G.I. Joes, Transformers, Robotech, all that stuff. And so when it came out, I was like, I hate him. And why, how, does he, how did he get this? Like, how, how, how did you go from something like Godman to get to do something like Transformers versus G.I. Joe and stuff like that. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it kind of works like that. Like, whatever your favorite thing is, like, you're not gonna get hired to do your favorite thing. It's always gonna be like somebody who doesn't care about it as much as you do. That's uh, the person who's gonna get that job, you know? <laughs> it's just the way it works. I mean, for that particular thing, like I had been, I had spent like my whole career doing you know, like doing my own thing and doing, uh, you know, self-published or small press or, you know, like um, those kind of comics. And 
and just kind of hit like a little bit of like a brick wall with it. Like I, like I felt like I, I, you know, wasn't going where I, I wanted to go. So I just kind of thought like, okay, like how, like, how does somebody like break into comics or whatever? Like, how do you, what is that? How do you do that? And I thought like, what's like, what are the rules? Like, how do you do? And so I just, you know, just started like sub putting feelers out to like every company, just like, you know, going down the, of like, I want to like, I want somebody to offer me money to make comics. Like that's, I want that, <laughs> that, like, that's what I wanted. So I just kind of put it out there to every, and like followed their submission guidelines and stuff. And, and some companies, you know, don't take submissions or didn't take submissions at that point. And, and I just followed like, and for IDW, it was like, if you want to work for IDW, here's where you send your samples. And so I sent my samples to, to that. And then uh, John Barber, who's like the editor of, of like the, um, he was at the time was like the editor of, of like the, the Transformers stuff. And, and now he's, I think, editor in chief. Um, you know, he just happened to be he, looking through that stuff. And he said, he said like, that wasn't something he did very often. It was just kind of as time permitted, he would sort of look through that, whatever you call it, the slush pile. And then he saw my name and, you know, he was kind of excited about that. Like he, he, he knew me and knew my work and was really you know happy that I was like, you know, offering, offering my, my services to IDW. And so we started talking and, you know, he gave me some like cover assignments on various things. And then in pretty short order, he, he said he was just, he like, um, he said he was like, he was like in the tub or something. And, and like the idea just came to wow. him of like a Transformers and GI Joe crossover, uh, where, um, like Cybertron is like, um, Cybertron is like, uh, I forget exactly what, like, like that Cybertron's like New Genesis or, or like Apocalypse or like it was one of those, what, he, it was some Kirby reference yeah, that yeah. he made it like in my style and stuff and like asked me if I wanted, I wanted to do that. And, and you know, uh, like you said, it's like, that's like a dream job. Like I would have never in a million years thought like, oh, let me try to audition for Transformers and G.I. Joe, but <laughs> it's something that like so perfectly played to my strengths. I like couldn't believe it. Like, and I really saw it as this like amazing opportunity because there aren't, there aren't like very many, like in, in terms of like, you know, pop culture, you know, franchises or whatever you want to call them. There aren't too many like perfect matches, but that was like a, a perfect match that, you know, just made total sense, you know, once he said it. Yeah. I, I, I would have paid, I would, I think I would have paid them to do that. It's so, <laughs> it's, it's so romantic too, how that happened. He was in the tub and had this inspiration <laughs> and <laughs> thought of you. I mean, wow. Hey, I don't, do, do most of those things come about that way? I don't know. I don't think so. I, think I don't, I, mean, I think like the real <laughs> magical stuff. Uh, yeah. You know, around that way, like you, you can't, you can't force it, you know, it kind of like, it kind of, it kind of has to happen in like weird ways. But were you were you were a fan before you started doing it, right? You or were you just sort of? I'm like the age where like I remember when all that stuff was new. Like uh -huh. I remember, you know, they're not being transformers and then they're being transformed. I remember there, you know, I remember seeing like the 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 ads for the GI Joe cartoon and being intrigued and like wondering like who are these characters. So, I, yeah, I'm part of that. I I and I loved that stuff as a kid. I kind of like largely um left it behind when i went to adulthood like i was really into it and then and then and then all those things got canceled like the cartoon yeah. not, yeah, not yeah, the comic. Yeah. never yeah. followed the comics mm -hmm. okay but i did follow the cart the cartoons and then they got canceled and then kind of like you know it wasn't really an interest and then i kind of dipped into it like a little bit in in adulthood of like like i'd heard in retrospect like how great the gi joe comic was oh. so i started checking mm -hmm. out little bits and pieces of it and and like especially the silent issue, silent interlude, the Snake Eyes issue. Like everybody was like, "That's that's like comic you got to check out." So I checked that out and and loved it. And then I tried a couple other GI Joe comics and didn't quite get into it as much as I got into that one. And then the Transformers stuff too. Like Transformers kind of in like the early two thousands, I guess, like made this kind of comeback. And like the the comics, um, I wasn't like blown away by the stories at that point, but like just the look of it was amazing. Like it looked like they got the sort of Transformers 1986, uh, you know, movie look and, and figured out a way to make, you know, a whole line of comics that look like that. So, so that was, that was my connection to it. Like 
so I had, you know, this like nostalgia and a and like connection to it. And it, and it was like a touchstone, like for a period of my life, it was that sort of like, uh, you know, the modern mythology, the thing they always talk about, oh, you know, it, it was like the modern mythology. It was like, you'd, you'd turn on the TV and there'd be some new installment of this like, you know, weird ongoing, yeah. you know, epic. Yeah, I think that's interesting that like maybe maybe the fact that you didn't read those comics a lot, you know, when you were a kid, maybe made those comics even better. You know, the ones that you did. Like when I read them, I was like, oh, it, it almost kind of felt like something new. It wasn't like a rehashing of, of the 80s stuff, which I love, but because it wasn't, it was something that I was interested in. You know, a lot of these reprints nowadays are just kind of rehashing of what was uh, was was already done, so yeah, that, that's awesome. That's so an awesome Tim, 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 did you watch, did you read the the GI Joe comics before the the TV show? Because I was a fan of the TV show, the the cartoon. Like oh, I, oh. I saw like the movie, you know, like, and I, I just I loved the, perfect, the whole. Yeah, I was yeah. the perfect customer. I was like yeah. the one that was like, oh, the the TV show. I gotta get the toys. I gotta get the comics. <laughs> I gotta get the cereal. I gotta get you know, like I gotta get everything. And I don't think I appreciated G.I. Joe, the comics, as much as I do now. Like, mm -hmm. now when I, I, I have a lot of them, most of them, and now that I read them, I'm like, oh, these are brilliant. And, like, all the military stuff, it's like, this is great. But back then, I was just like, <laughs> we're snake eyes. I want to see snake, you know, it's just like, but it, the nuances is not as, as there, you know. And I think that's why, like, when I see new stuff, like, Tom's um, take on it, I was like very taken aback and was very like blown away. I was really amazed by it. I loved it. I hold those old uh, G.I. Joe comics, like the Larry Hama mm -hmm. stuff, like, I hold it in the highest regard. And again, like I didn't really know that stuff before I started this project, but then I got caught up pretty quick, like, you know, yeah. read through all of it. And I'm, I'm a huge fan now. And I think, I think it stands up to like, you know, the great, you know, comic book, you know, superhero kind of like it, I think it stands up to you know the X Men or whatever. Yeah. Like, and it, and it's still going on. Like he's still making new issues, yeah. and it's one continuous story. Have you ever met Larry Hama? Uh, no, I I mean just just like via uh, email or or like Facebook Messenger or something. Like I've never met him in person. I've had a couple like things that where like I almost went to where like you know we would have. Uh, you know, been, you know, part of the same event or whatever, but, but yeah, no, it never, never happened. I, I, I'd like to, I mean, I, I, you know, really like his work and uh, what I did, you know, in that comic was in a very large part, like a tribute to his work, but I don't, you know, I think, um, uh, I think a lot of uh, creators, especially like of that generation are sort of um, maybe like a little uncomfortable with uh, that kind, you know, or, or, you know, don't quite know how to react to that kind of like adulation, you know, like, like Larry seems like a pretty humble guy and, and that generation, they seem like a pretty humble generation. And, um, and like, I know like the GI Joe work is like really important to him and really, really personal. Mm -hmm. And so, so, you know, but, but, but yeah. Oh man, I, I, I thought it was a great connection, but we'll move on from that because yeah. I, mean, I can sit here and talk to you about that forever. So, <laughs> I mean, I think it's, it was a cool connection that, that you brought up though, how you were able to um, put the Kirby spin on that uh, Transformers and GI Joe material, where you were, you know, bringing in that that kind of fourth world um, setup, like of the interactions of the different parties. I, I guess I kind of want to go back to the beginning, though. I'm curious how you found your way to Jack Kirby, because um, I know for me at least, it was it was a little bit like, and I'm not. I'm not an expert at all. Like, just let's make this clear. Like, I don't think any of the three of us are like super, you know, I well am. read a, on I'm that total, stuff. But I um, totally am. You know, I've tried, and like and initially at first, you know, I would hear so much about like what you know, Kirby's the king. But um, you know, it was hard to find good editions of the, the relevant material to read, and it was also you know hard to look at some of that stuff in in a retrospect where like so I've consumed so much art that was influenced by that original material it's not quite the same as seeing it you know in its original state so I don't know I'm just curious how you how you got there because I think you're kind of the same age as us pretty much so yeah yeah much um yeah so it was like you know Kirby was not like he was like the previous generation yeah. you know he 
like or or he was he belonged to the pre like he was the people who were his fans were like a generation or two removed mm -hmm. you know so like it, you know when we were growing up like that kirby wasn't like a hot name like he was like a name from the past and um you know i it was I, I was just kind of like i guess vaguely aware of him you know like in you know sort of like you know i don't know seventh grade eighth grade you know like high school like i was like kindly kind of vaguely aware like i um you know like i had like how to draw comics the marvel way mm -hmm. and so like i knew the name i knew you know stan lee and uh john biasema and then like i think kirby does get name checked there look like knowing what i know now there's like a ton of kirby art in that book and they are basically teaching you how to like think like Kirby and how to draw like Kirby in that book. But like, it didn't, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't know that then. Um, and, I, and Kirby was um, like, he was active in TV animation uh, around the time that I was a consumer of TV animation. So I, you know, so Thundar the Barbarian. Like, that was Kirby? Yeah, that was Jack Kirby. Oh. Yeah. Jeez, I yeah, love Alex Thunder. Yeah, designed the three main characters, and then Jack Kirby designed, like, pretty much everything else, like, all the villains and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it kind of burned that aesthetic into my head. Like, I really love that aesthetic. Uh, like, the, the um, you know, there's, like, a character called Gemini who had, like, these, like, you know, yeah. glowing eyes with all this, like, heavy, you know, makeup or whatever around his <laughs> whatever, you know, and he'd shoot lasers out of his eyes and stuff. Like, I love that aesthetic. And so as I got older, I'd find things that kind of, you know, rang that same bell and it was Jack Kirby. I just, I just didn't know the name. And, and so I'd, I'd read like, you know, old Marvel reprints. And again, Jack Kirby's name would be right there, but all I'd see is Stan Lee because mm -hmm. Stan Lee was like a name that was familiar to me. He, he narrated, you know, the cartoons, Spider-Man and his amazing friends and the Incredible Hulk. So I knew Stan Lee. And then like my brain just kind of, you know, blanked out like whatever other names were there. Uh, and then, yeah, like, I, I guess, like, when I got, and I heard his, Kirby's name as, like, an important guy, and, and I remember when he died, like, that was, like, a big deal, but again, I wasn't quite sure exactly who he was, like, I knew he was in that sort of, like, John Buscema, John Ramita, I knew he was kind of, like, in that world, but I didn't know that he was, like, the guy uh, mm -hmm. un until, like, you know, freshman year of college, and then it was, like, you know, Kirby had died, and so then you started having it was kind of like, you know, Kirby uh, tributes. And, 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 and so like I, I discovered like the Jack Kirby collector magazine and the art of Jack Kirby and just kind of like looking at that stuff, it all came together. I was like, oh, this is that guy. This is the Thundar guy. This is the, oh, you know, yeah. dark guy. Like all, the, all these like little bits and pieces um, it came together. So, so did you, were you a comics fan before that time? Like, what were you looking at before, you know, when you were in seventh grade or whatever grade you yeah. were looking at Jack Kirby stuff? I mean, I, you know, I, I was a fan of like the old Marvel stuff. I just didn't have a ton of access to it. So I had like maybe two or three comics, you know, old Marvel comics, and they just happened to be Jack Kirby oh. Marvel comics. Uh, but then it was like, it was Frank Miller. You know, it was uh, all the Batman, so like Batmania was going on, like with the Batman <laughs> movie and stuff. So, um, you know, it was, um, so anything Batman, it was like it, the Frank Miller Batman stuff. And then um, like the current Batman of the time, which was like Jim Aparo and uh, Denny O'Neill, I think maybe was, you know, writing it and- um, Neil Adams. Yeah, Neil Adams. Like, so any anything Batman. And then um, you had like, Death in the Family, and you had all those like th mm -hmm. this was like an era of really great Mike Mignola covers, mm. and they like Mike Mignola right before Hellboy, and so he was get it was like a perfect perfect fit for Batman, so it was, was kind of like this gothic imagery and like a uh, picture of like just like um, Robin's corpse on the cover of one of the books, you know, and, and uh, all that kind of stuff, and then um, and I was like starting to get into like what was like considered indie comics then, which would have been like um, Nexus and uh, <laughs> American Flag and, you know, like, like. Um, You're speaking our language. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I told you, I told you. <laughs> yeah. I love the, I love the chance to geek out like this, you know, um, because me and Josh, uh, we have just recently discovered Kirby, 
you know, um, I have re definitely recently. Like, I remember when I was a kid, you know, like, uh, Kirby was always, like, too old for me. You know, I was, like, more, like, image and, like, I want the, the gradient c colors and stuff. And then when you looked at an old comic, you're like, well, this is just old, you know? Uh, but now when I look, I've been, I've been collecting some and they're, like, gorgeous, you know? Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> they're so beautiful. And, like, I think also part of that was the, the stuff that I saw from Kirby before were, like, um, reprints. And they would reprint it on fancy shiny paper with like right. you know, new inks, new colors and stuff. Yeah. And what you notice is that that yellowing paper, that like all that stuff is what makes the Kirby art so amazing. Like when you look at it now in just like the old, like, you know, the original print, it's like mind blowing, you know? It, it's true. Like that, that yellow newsprint, like the reason why I've embraced that aesthetic, it's incredibly flattering. Yeah. Like it makes everybody look good. And that whole like, Every artist who like worked in that medium uh, and, and had their work reproduced in that way, when everything switched over, they like the the, compa the comparison was terrible. Like they all looked bad in comparison mm -hmm. to like the way they were being colored like a year or two prior. And really, like the only people whose work looks really good in this new format are the people who came into comics after that and like figured out what to do with that aesthetic or, or, you know, in, in like the rare cases, somebody who figured out how to adapt, but it, it's totally different. And just like talking about like GI Jones, the thing that, that I'd say to, to, to look at is like, take your like old um, newsprint copy of that silent interlude GI Joe comic, and then put it next to like um, all the reprinted versions, like, like, um, you know, the current version and, and like the version that if you bought like a Snake Eyes character that got packaged with a comic book or something, like compare it to those. And it's it's like night and day, like the, the one on the newsprint is like this beautiful atmospheric comic that takes place at night and has all kinds of like shadows and fog. And then the, uh, the, the glossy version takes place in the, it, at noon and <laughs> no atmosphere it's, it's just like two different experiences and, and it's, yeah. it's it's uh you know like it's it's kind of like uh you know comics uh that or that kind of com like superhero comics like lost their soul when they went over to the glossy paper yeah mm -hmm. i mean you, you're totally i was just looking at that like i have a, a 25th anniversary edition of the the silent interlude and i just recently just recently got the original one just recently and I was looking at it, and and you you're completely right. It's like it's mind blowing how, you know, just the amazing the aesthetics are back in the you know and like that ink with the little dots and just all that stuff and like the mis registrations of the color, mm -hmm. it all just yeah. adds to like awesome this, focus. It's so beautiful. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. So you you try to capture a lot of that feeling in in this book like in the the art that you do for this book like with the the like the yellow and kind of grayish yellow paper like it's so amazing when you look at like you guys were talking about the um like a reprint of an old comic and the white in the gutters is so bright yeah and just overpowering so i i don't you really i really noticed that with your art in this book like how how the pages um you know, really hang together very well and, and they're so beautiful. I'm kind of curious how you, um, how you arrived at drawing Kirby, how you did, because you draw him in this mm -hmm. really, um, kind of like a manga, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, or like a, a com like a comic strip almost, like a, right. almost like Peanuts proportions, like he's got a pretty big head and big eyes. <laughs> he's and always I, adorable. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's great, but I'm curious how you got there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was like it. I I arrived there organically. Like it was something that occurred to me as I was working on this project, uh, because I did like there was a version of it, uh, like not not I didn't draw the entire book, but I I I'd drawn like some sequences with yeah, like a pretty standard you know Jack Kirby you know relatively realistic you know as you know as realistic as as sort of that kind of you know comic book style can be. And it just, like, it just didn't, um, like, it was, it just felt like it was missing something. Uh, you know, like, he kind of almost, like, faded into the background a little bit. Um, and, and I was drawing, like, I was drawing, like, young Kirby, like, a child Kirby. And, like, you know, I gave him sort of, like, you know, cartoony, you know, 
child, you know, baby, you know, proportion, <laughs> that kind of thing. And like, I felt a real connection to that character. And it was like, you know, when he grows up and kind of like loses the, the, that, it just like, like I missed that kid, you know, like I missed that Kirby. And so I, I, you know, kind of just like, like this was like a way to kind of keep that, that Kirby alive and, 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 and it kind of, it worked, it, it ended up like working, you know, in a bunch of, in a bunch of different ways that like I hadn't quite anticipated, but, you know, largely it was just like, you know, just like finding a way to like make like you as a reader and me as a reader, like as I'm sort of, you know, reading this thing and, and, and seeing like how it works to just kind of like pull you into the story more, make you identify with him more, make you like see the world through his eyes. And, um, you know, and, and just um, that whole approach. Um, and like, yeah, like, it, you know, it's pretty, you know, pretty famously adopted in manga and then, um, and, and, you know, Tezuka, you know, got it from, like Walt Disney and stuff. So it's like this really, um, you know, and yeah, like peanuts, like it's, it's just sort of, it's just sort of like cartoon language um, that like for whatever reason, uh, like like we as a species just really connect with it. Um, and, and um, you know, like it, it just, it, it felt like it was the way to go and, and I'll probably like I I thought it was a really good fit for this project, but I'll I'll probably employ it in like some future projects too. Like I I think I think there like I think there really is like gold there. I think there's a reason why like <laughs> you know like manga is sort of like the global uh com it's like manga is like the comics that that the the world has embraced, where um you know sort of like that uh um sort of like superhero idiom or whatever that uh, like that that adventure strip style of of drawing is like regional like it, it's really like it's like america and the uk and like it, it, it's it, it's kind of universal right it worked in a, in so many different ways like i i thought like i mean i think it it really emphasizes like the childlike personality mm -hmm. that that kirby has yeah. not just in his like imagination but and, and how he deals with uh, some of the less savory aspects of the business that he's in, like the adult world and how dependent he is on Roz. Um, and also I think it was, it was a great device for putting some distance between him and some of his, the other people that he interacts with. Yeah. That, I mean, that's exactly what it does. It makes, yeah. it's, it's um, it makes you like the one character who's drawn that way. It's like, okay, that's the guy, you know, that's yeah. who, um, and then everything else is like the the sensual world that that this character uh, you know inhabits and 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 you know walks in and uh, yeah and, and like I, I mean I'd learned that whole uh, way of like talking about it and thinking about it from Scott McCloud like he named he called it like the masking effect and it just it just felt like a really good fit and I had been reading the uh, there was there was like a Tezuka biographical manga and so it's it, like I had been reading you know just prior to and, and and while I was working on this so that had to like kind of you know uh prime the pump a little like that I, I think that definitely had its role to play like I saw how you know how well that that worked there and, and it just seemed like a really good good way of of you know pulling your focus that Tezuka book is pretty recent right yeah so, so did, how fast did you draw this? I mean, you... I, I spent like three years like drawing mm. it, I think mm. so. Okay. Do, um, what was the, uh, what was behind the, your choice not to ink it? Or do you normally ink your stuff? Um, I really love, I, I love the look, but, um, but like, you know, I, I think it looks really great, especially when you contrast the, the pencils uh, that he's drawing. I think it like works really well. I um, just wanted to see what you're thinking of when you were decided, like, hey, I'm just going to do really dark pencils and some shading here. Well, I mean, like, Kirby, like, he spent his life in pencil. Like, you know, that was that was his medium of choice. And, uh, you know, he, he occasionally, like, very, very occasionally inked things. But really, like, this, this was what his work was. 
and he didn't spend a ton of time like you know reading his own comic books or anything so like as far as he knew this is what his work was was like you know a work in in pencil so it just you know and and that um so like i mean it's like a perfect fit for this project but i had been like starting in in that direction like even before this book and and it was exactly that it was like seeing kirby and seeing like how much depth and richness and life there was to his pencils and then even like his greatest inkers there was still like some degree of interpretation and it wasn't just those inkers individual like personalities and and, and quirks it was also just like the medium of ink and that um like i mean the first time i saw a jack kirby pencil drawing like a, like a reproduction like in a book it blew my mind because like i'd never seen any comic that looked like that and then you'd get this long explanation, you know, back then in like the 90s of like, oh, well, here's why you can't, like, here's why it needs to be ink because the technology is such that can't blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But now it can, <laughs> like all those things, it could, and you can just take the pencil and apply color to it. And um, when I started doing that to my, to my own work, it, it just had this richness. Um, and, you know, I would, um, I would ink things and then color them and they would just, they'd look too clean. They didn't look right to me. And so then I'd find ways to like scuff them up and, mm -hmm. and you know, get a razor out and things like that. And, and I realized like, well, with a pencil, it like automatically scuffs itself up. It's, it's, like, a, it's like a tiny airbrush or something. Yeah. Like, like you get a crisp line, but it also like cracks and spits and, and does all this like amazing little, like I just it fell in love with the pencil. And, and so it was just like, it, it, it was like a, a trajectory I was already on, but then mm -hmm. like when I came to this project, it's, it's like, it was like a perfect fit. It was like all that exploration was sort of meant for this. Did you, did you do it on Bristol or did you do it on like a toothier, you know, because it was pencil? Yeah, I did it on, Bristol? on yeah. yeah, yeah, it was on Bristol. You get enough of up. Mm -hmm. like, even, cool. even on the, like, the, the, like that, like smooth finish. Scratchy thing. Yeah. 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 So, Tom, tell me like how, like we never really talked about how you got, decided to make a book about, I mean, Jack Kirby, how did this all came about and like who did, you know, where did, who did you approach or who approached you to like come up with? Yeah, this? I mean, it, 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 it's, it's like, it was sort of like this thing I'd always wanted to read, but it didn't exist, you yeah. know. I always wanted to read like a biography by Kirby. I always, I always wondered, oh, did he ever do, you know, like an autobio kind of thing? And it's like, he did like one short autobio thing. And, and so it was like one of those things, like you sort of, that's, that's kind of where like ideas come from. You think, oh, I'd really like to see this. And mm -hmm. then it does this. So then you do it yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was something I kind of like was toying with. And then his like hundredth birthday came, was coming up. And it was like, like well, I really blew it. Like, if I was going to do that Kirby thing, I should have had it in time for his hundredth birthday. <laughs> but then, well, I can't, I can't, I can't do anything about that. So let me just, so I started it. I started it like pretty shortly before it, like I just got into production. I just like started, you know, I, I did like a couple test things and then just started like really like rolling with it and just like posting it um, on Instagram and Twitter and stuff hmm. around then. And then um, kind of, you know, shopped it around, to a couple different places and um, got, got like an agent and then, uh, and then got like the book deal with Top Shelf. Oh, not Top Shelf, why did I say Top Shelf? 10 Speed. <laughs> They're Tell both me. TS. Yeah, TS. I was, I was curious because I, I am curious about 10 Speed Press. Are they, are they, are they the Bay, in the Bay Area? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I believe they are. Yeah, oh, they've been yeah. out in the 70s, I think. Yeah, but ha have they ever done comics? They have, they've been doing, um, they've been doing comics for like, you know, I don't know, like uh, maybe five years, I don't know, maybe 10 years, like just the way time's been going by, but they, they've been doing comics for a while. And, uh, you know, like they, I think they did like a history of video games, like a history of wrestling. Mm -hmm. uh, so they had been, you know, expanding into, into like graphic novels and stuff. And, and now like they, they, they do a lot of them. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the production of the book is mm -hmm. amazing, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. It's not something that you normally would get. Like, it, I mean, it's like, it's got that awesome, like, spot gloss on, mm -hmm. the, on the cover and stuff like that. And I, I was like, ooh, who made this? And I was like, 10 speed. I've never, mm -hmm. you know, 
heard about them doing comics, but it's a it's a gorgeous looking book. Mm. I mean, you know, uh, I, ironically, like one of the projects they did was like how to how to make comics the Stan Lee way. I think like they, they did like. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's funny. They tell both sides there. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> Tom, tell me about the research that went into into this book. Was it mo mostly um, your experience with like diving into the comics, or you know, and talking with your buddies in Pittsburgh about it, or what else? Yeah, I, I mean, it was. It's like it's like um, it was just like years and years of being super curious about Jack Kirby as a fan and as like an aspiring creator and then as a creator like it, it's just been this like ongoing project of just like learning everything i could possibly learn about kirby mm -hmm. and then like applying it uh you know to, like like actually something where like you know you finally find like an outlet for this like weird like geeky uh mm -hmm. obsession that you have um and then it, and then it becomes a job then it becomes like okay now i have to verify and and really uh you know go deep into it but but i had this like um you know structure in pl like this like sort of mental uh uh framework you know where it's like I, I i had a sense of like you know the trajectory of his life so it's just a matter of like going getting like really detailed about like okay what comes first what affects what okay was this person really there for that or, um, are these two stories getting combined or, or you know, the, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Did you, like in the whole process of like all of the research and then producing the book, did it, like how did it change your, um, like how you feel about Kirby? Well, I mean, like I, I, I liked him a lot uh, before. Like I, um, you know, I was, you know, largely uh, attracted to like the work itself, you know, and then I like, learned about like the person behind it and like surprise surprise he was he was a pretty great person like he you know he didn't turn out to be like a scumbag or <laughs> like you know anything you know like um and and that you know i i came out finishing this book you know still still feeling that that same way i mean the 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 difference is like when I finished the book, I was like so tired. Like I was so ex physically exhausted from like, you know, cataloging, just like listing the creations that he came up with in his lifetime. So it just really made me appreciate the, um, like the stamina that he had, that like, like he had to create all this stuff and he didn't just have to spend like a page or a panel or whatever discussing it. He would have to do like an entire comic and then like an entire series and then, you know, eight years, you know, like, so like, I just, I don't know how he did it. Like it's, it, you know, like it, it, uh, it's, it's just like, I don't know, something about that generation or like growing up, uh, you know, in poverty and, 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 uh, going to war or so like, I don't know, I don't know what it is that drives that engine, but I was just like in awe of, of, uh, you know, the, like the energy that it takes. And like, um, people would talk about like Jack Kirby's like appetite, like he, just like you know consume food and like you know big big fat hamburgers and chocolate <laughs> and like i get like it like it really was exercise like him at a drawing and and he wasn't a, like after his sort of like youth he wasn't a very physically active person so he really was like burning all these calories with like brain power and, <laughs> and wrist action yeah Ah, I, I need to, to follow that that regimen. Yeah. I think <laughs> brain it doesn't power. work for everyone. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. <laughs> I love the the you know the, the last part where you talk about all the things that he has created and how mm -hmm. you know like how much uh, Hollywood and and all these people have been starting making so much money out of his creations and you're just in awe. Like like he made he did Black Panther. He did like you know. Yeah. And all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. it's like really, um, to me, like kind of like real amazing, uh, like um, like 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 that that much imagination comes out of one person. You know what I mean? Like you're lucky, okay. you're lucky in a lifetime to come up with a, a a Black Panther and to come up with all these. You know, that's crazy. Captain America, yeah. 
yeah, it, it's like, like you could sort of stop his story at certain points and like that would be more than enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Going. And it's kind of interesting too, it was to, to me like how it seemed like almost all of the things he was creating were not, it wasn't under ideal conditions. It was always like, we need you to do something like this for, for this company, or we need you to, to, to fill in this slot here. What can you do for us, Jack? And it, mm -hmm. like, I kind of, like, did he, what work of his do you think was, I don't know, the most creative, like purely creative, where it was like, he had a chance to do whatever he wanted and this is what he did. Well, yeah, I mean, there's there's like a lot of answers to that question because it is it is a question of like these guys who like establish themselves in like a commercial medium. It is kind of like okay, like what's you like yeah. what like how, like how much of it is just like oh here's your assignment and you're fulfilling this like you know you're solving this interesting puzzle. Like what do you care about, Jack Kirby? What are you into? And and when uh, uh, somebody asked him, you know, pretty late in life. Like, oh, could you do a, you, you always tell those like great stories about when you were a kid. Could you do a comic about that? And he was like, what? You know, like, who, who cares about that? That Nobody would care about that. And then he did it. And it's like this, this great comic, uh, Street Code, about like the kind of like gang fights you get in. Um, like he, he talks about like, like he was, you know, he, he wasn't like a comics fan. Like he was a fan of the pulps mm -hmm. and like the fiction pulps. That's the stuff he kind of grew up, like hit him at the right age. And then um, that's the stuff that he obsessively collected, like a comic collector collects. Love the sci-fi stuff. And if you like read his work, like he would tell you, oh, I, you know, I, it doesn't matter. I can work on anything. I could work on a Western. I could work on war. I could work on superhero. I could work on whatever. And it's all the same to me. You know, I, 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 I can do anything. But like his, his sci-fi stuff always seemed to have like a little something extra. And you, and you could, and you can kind of tell like, that's his, that's, you know, that's his favorite. That's his darling. That, that's, um, you know, th that's his, what he'd be working on, like, if he had his druthers. Like, um, but then there, you know, there was art that he did purely, like, in his spare time that wasn't a job. Um, and those were, like, um, you know, drawings, like, from the Bible and um, collage work and like weird color things and um you know a lot of sci-fi so, like sci-fi always seemed to like creep in like no matter what it what like if it like he would do like bible stories with you know sci-fi angels and things like that so um you know all those different things kind of give you a clue of, of you know what his his thing was but um you know he he never like sort of directly stated like okay what i really want to do is is this and you know uh which which a lot of artists have like a lot of artists have said oh what I really wanted to do was this but my career you know took me here. What was your um, your decision to um, write it in in the way that you did? With, where you writing in in Jack Kirby's voice as if it's an autobiographical novel? You know what I mean? Um, yeah. You referenced that uh, like your desire to read a Jack uh, Kirby autobiographical novel and it never happened. So I kind of wonder if that's the reason. But uh, I want you you know what, yeah. What, I mean, it, yeah, it's it's like a continuation of that of that like wish fulfillment of that desire to like read Jack Kirby's story, like like you know, from him and 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 the thing of like you'd always hear these stories about um, you know people would just like knock on his door, they'd like look his name up in the phone book, knock on the door mm -hmm. and be invited in, and then he'd tell them war stories and tell them uh, you know stories about you know comics industry and his his, his childhood and stuff, and so like it was kind of like that like you know, like I wanted to like, you know, hang out with Jack Kirby for an afternoon and like have him like, you know, tell me, you know, <laughs> tell me the story. And yeah. and I imagine other people would want that experience too. So I kind of, you know, fr framed it that way. Again, it was, it was like, it was a creative decision. Like I could have told the book a different way, but that was, you know, same thing with like the, the stylist, all the stylistic choices and things. You know, there's a million ways you could do this. It's just like, these were like the ones that made sense to me. When you when you were writing it, did you? Because uh, when I was reading it, I honestly kind of felt like I, I don't know what Jack Kirby really actually sounds like, but I kind of made a voice for him in my head, you know, mm -hmm. as I was reading it. Especially, you know, like my one of my favorite parts are just like the little quick snippets of like weird um, 
gang fights, <laughs> you know, where like they would fight and then they would pick them up and then take them back home or something like that, you know. And it was just such a, it's just these stories are just all, like they're like so wholesome, but also yeah. kind of like a weird world where like they, yeah. it's, it's fight, we're fighting, you know. <laughs> and uh, but when I read it, I try it, like it sounds like it's in his voice, which is magical to me. Because a lot of that is like your writing as well, you know. It really does sound like it's from a guy like Jack Kirby is talking like this, you know, like in these like weird short snippets, like yeah, and then we fought, and then with this, you know, it's like really neat. But like when you were writing it, did you like kind of get in his head? Were you like writing in his voice, you know, like how how did you get it so that it you you would think it sounds like him too, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, like it was like trying to get into character and and try trying to like, uh, you know embody you know like his voice and things and there, there there was like a lot of kind of like decisions and lines to walk to because um like I tried to capture like the essence of of his voice but um like if you get too close like the like the Jack Kirby has like a very um idiosyncratic way of talking mm. and Harry's through in his writing too his writing is very idiosyncratic and I, I, like, if I did it spot on, it would be um, really hard to follow. Like, like, <laughs> you know, like, it would be hard to understand. Um, so, like, I kind of had to, like, make, like, a, you know, it's like, it's Jack Kirby, but it's like Jack Kirby, if he could talk about his work in the same way that, like, you know, Gil Kane or Alex Toth does. Like, I, like I had, I had to like you know try try to keep his voice but also um have him him you know speak in a in a way that like we could understand because mm -hmm. he what like, he 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 did have a very cryptic way of speaking and um i i tried to maintain as much of that as i could but i i kind of you know had it, it was it was yeah it was like a balance a balancing act and and it like it feels it feels right uh, occasionally i would drop in some uh you know like actual kirby quotes and and you know those are, those are like you know probably the ones that are like a little you know the most uh, you know sort of like left of center. The 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 drawings the, the Kirby drawings that you have in here you know the pencils and stuff like that did you recreate like Kirby drawings or did you just use his drawings and and like kind of Photoshop them in because they're amazing if you oh yeah I mean it was it was all me like that was oh, that was wow. really. It, yeah, that was me doing my Jack Kirby impersonation. Like that's Dang. that's the one skill I did develop. Uh, you that's know, amazing. very very early on was like imitating Jack Kirby, and it's kind of something I I don't use as much anymore. Like sort of as I found my own voice. But then again, this is like the perfect project to employ it, and so, so I good. The world. I thought, I thought they were all just pages that you photoshopped in because I was uh, like. Yeah. That's so that, good. That, that, that's that's me just doing doing my Jack Kirby thing. And you would look at uh, like originals and it's kind of like uh, and then like did your own version of it. Yeah, and then sometimes I'd even like sometimes like originals don't exist, so I'd kind of you know reverse engineer what I thought like the Jack Kirby drawing would have would have looked like. And again, this wow. the same sort of adjustments I made to his dialogue. I would kind of make to the drawings too, just just again to make them like a little more clear. Yeah, where yeah, like yeah. I'd done them exactly, they'd be like too small, like you know, they're so I kind of kind of blow them up. Like he'd kind of draw like a little larger on the page uh, in my comic than he would in real life, but just just so that you you as the reader can see what's on his drawing board. Like just look at this page; <laughs> where it's just all his drawings. <laughs> You're like, That's crazy! Wow, yeah, those, those pages honestly... were really fun because it is it was. It, became this like interesting uh, effect of like, you have this sort of full color world he's in and then that like black and white pencil drawing world kind of creeps in more. And then you have those moments where it's like just all pencil and hand and like a hand and, and like a yellow number two pencil. Oh. <laughs> so amazing. I have this image of there being like this a community of hardcore Kirbyologists out there who like know everything about him and have very strong opinions on controversial like issues is that is that accurate or is that oh yeah are those people yeah. nice to you like do they look, <laughs> have you been getting I, good feedback have i been getting good feed um yeah i mean i've been getting good feedback 
from like, yeah, like, like Kirby experts or whatever. I'm still waiting for like the big like bag of uh, sand to like drop on me from some, you know, Kirby expert saying, no, 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 this, you got this part wrong or you got that. Because like, the, like it, it is what you described. There is a community of really like diehard Kirby scholars who know everything there is to know about Kirby. And, and like, I, I would have been one of them. If somebody else made this book, I'd be <laughs> I, like, oh no, no. And like, <laughs> like I'd probably be too uh, classy to like air my grievances in public. But if, if like, you know, if, if I met you or whatever, I'd, I'd be able to tell you, oh, did you read that Kirby book? Oh, you got this wrong in that book. Uh, but yeah, no, I haven't. And then the other thing is like the, um, the, the Super Stan Lee fans, kind of like wait like I haven't heard I haven't heard like I haven't gotten the the I, I think maybe because like um like comic conventions are like on hold and stuff like I th it would be interesting to see like you yeah. know what word on the street was you know at, at like a comic convention or something but no I mean so far so far it's all been it's all been glowing but but I I am braced and, and ready ready for uh you know somebody to get their sort of like slide rule out and you know <laughs> Say like, oh, you missed missed this here, and and again, like, you know, Kirby's life is a huge story, so, uh, you know, I had I had to leave things out, and and I'm sure there's somebody, some you know, Kirby, uh, acolyte out there who's like favorite thing didn't make it into, the, but I did I did my best. I like I I feel like I uh, gave a lot of time to like some things that like when someone's doing an overview of Kirby's life, they kind of leave out, so. Uh, you know, yeah. I think when you're a fan, even if you miss things uh, and you you interpret things with you know, the heart that you have in this book, I, I it's hard to argue. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. if it was like someone just got paid to do this book and missed things, uh, if I was a Kirby you know fan, I would be like, no, oh, you missed this. But I mean, you can just feel that like you have the love and respect for this person, this subject matter. So I don't, I you know, I I don't. I don't see that much coming. I mean, I guess there are jerks out there, but you know. Yeah, and and you know, jerks are gonna be jerks. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, no, I, I like I'm a huge fan of all kinds of things, and like, I have my like fan side where like I'll get very uh you know angry over like very minute like stupid things. So like I totally get it if, yeah. if somebody you know felt that way uh, you know about this. Well, I would think that you know the uh, the your colleagues and like Ed and Ed Pitzker and and Jim Rugg probably have I don't know if you've talked to them about or got some feedback on when while you were writing the book if they had any any con had any conversations with them because I know they're you know very <laughs> they have a, a huge opinions about about comics and and they have like scholarly and, knowledge yes right yeah I mean I like I wouldn't like I wouldn't want to speak for them or anything but like they were huge supporters of this book all along like from the very beginning and I did like you know they are like two of, of like a very small number of people that I kind of like share my work with when it's in progress and they've been like a hundred percent behind this and um and even when I was sort of, when this was like one of many projects that I was considering working on, they were like, no, that Kirby book, that's the book. That's the book you got to do. Like they were insistent. And I feel like it is like, it is the thing that's sort of most up their alley of like everything I've done because like those guys, like probably even more so than me, like those guys are huge fans of like the inside baseball of comics mm -hmm. of like what this guy did and what that guy did. So this is like, like they're they're you know, I think like kind of the perfect audience for for this book. Yeah, I mean, I I I, I wanted to ask you about that because you know, I'm always curious about communities of cartoonists. You know, that's one of the my my favorite things. You know, like well, obviously, like we're, we're in the Bay Area, we have some close knit communities as well. And I, you know, you Ed and um, and Jim, I, I always kind of think of as a kind of a crew. But it's like crazy to me that there were like three people in the same kind of area that found each other, that, that became friends, that like had this like crazy encyclopedic knowledge of comics. That <laughs> like I was like, how did how would how does three people like this exist in the world to begin with? And how did they just happen <laughs> to be in the same place? And and yeah, Magical. yeah, yeah. say it uh, can you tell a little bit about like how you guys like, you know, kind of like formed and like yeah, i mean is and is there something about the place 
yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I like I have wondered that like, is it a Pittsburgh thing? Like, is it, a, you know, I, I uh, yeah, I really like, I mean, I'm probably too close to it to have any kind of perspective on it. Like, I, yeah, like, I, I, I don't know. I mean, just like, you know, the way and yeah, the way we met, it's just like, I don't know, like back then, it, like, I don't know, it was like the either the late 90s or early 2000s or something. And like, comics just felt like a small, like smaller world back then. And um and particularly like comics in pittsburgh mm -hmm. you know very small like like just like the pittsburgh comics community has exploded since then it's like it's like massive like i don't you know i i don't know like hardly anybody in that you know it's, it's this and every now and then i'll find out like oh this person's from pittsburgh i didn't know that you know um but yeah we just kind of like uh um uh I, I think like like Jim was very proactive about building like a comics community at that time. Like he like he was kind of the one sort you know like it wasn't me. Like I was in my <laughs> own world doing my thing. Like not not you know like too busy to to think about anything but making comics. And so it was kind of like yeah, Jim and 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 Ed you know just kind of like approached me at like conventions and stuff and then, and then I think it was Jim like kind of put together this like you know weekly or or every other week like get together where we'd like go to the comic shop and then go to the coffee shop across the street and just like hang out and talk and whatever and, and it just kind of it, like it, it went from there that's funny that's like basically what their podcast is about <laughs> it's just too that seems like the model too right like that's that's like Dan Klaus and Adrian mm. Tomina and Richard Sala, <laughs> like they would go to they would go to Comic Relief in Berkeley, and then they would go to a coffee shop or whatever every yeah. week. Yeah, th that whole thing kind of continued into like car trips to conventions, and we'd just be like sitting in the car with like you know nine hours to kill, four hours to kill, and just like get these like you know crazy conversations going, and then by the end of the weekend, we'd kind of like have our marching orders of like okay, this is like, like the next step. Of, of comics, you know, is like this, you know, weird, like, uh, brain trust that we'd had in this, like, very, like, this, like, bubble, you know. Yeah, that's awesome. Is that how um, the, the um, Fantastic Four Grand Design came about? Because Ed had just done the X-Men Grand Design, which is, it was awesome, but then, uh, then you were, then you, when I, when they did the Fantastic Four Grand Design, and it's, and I read that it was you who were doing it. I was like, oh, of course, uh, you know. So like, is that a, did, was there any relation to the two projects? Yeah, I mean, um, like when Ed was work, like Ed was working on that X Men Grand Design, and then like Marvel was talking to him about like you know like follow ups or what it, like like expanding it or whatever, and like and he told me he's like. I didn't say anything like they they mentioned your name like i didn't say oh why don't you give it to time? like he's like like your name was like the first name uh that came from so like so either like they're seeing like uh an aesthetic and and i don't know spiritual similarity or something or maybe they're aware of the larger story maybe they're aware of of like oh yeah these guys all hang out together or whatever but but like yeah like it it it, it came there so like you know, un unless he's like trying to spare my feelings or something, and he's like <laughs> <laughs> telling them like, "Oh, you gotta give my friend Tom a job." Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's but, great. Uh, yeah. I, I love, I love those projects. Do, do you sometimes wish that these comics, like the uh, the the Fantastic Four Grand Design, could actually be printed on newsprint? Well, the my, the, um, the book is it's it's not printed on newsprint, but it's printed on like a very toothy. Oh wow! Stock. So, like to me, it's it's as good or better than newsprint. Like it it turned out exactly the way I wanted it to turn. Oh, like it was perfect. Like it really looks like, and especially like the the larger treasury version. It looks like that that old thing, and it and it you know it feels right. It's like a little more durable. Like it's not gonna tear like like the newsprint, but it it's it's got like exactly the look, and um and then uh and that was like a first. For me, I mean, uh, not quite. Uh, American Barbarian also had that too, but then like the the GI Joe Transformers stuff and the Gobots were done on like glossy paper. But mm -hmm. then I apply all those textural things 
to it, but it, it would still it was still glossy paper. But this was like, yeah, that like perfect finish. And then and then the the Jack Kirby book, it was like you know very similar kind kind yeah. of stock. And and yeah, just like that. That's exactly what I would want. I love when uh, when a, a book is produced the way that you mm. you intended it to. That's quite that's quite cool. So I was just going to bring up your Instagram, um, which I was I follow, and you've been posting these little um, superhero comic strips that are very playful and humorous, and it seems like you're kind of experimenting a lot with different digital art techniques and, and stuff like that. Is that a hint of what's coming, what you're working on, or is this just a palette cleanser? Or what are those strips about? Yeah, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's all of that. Like, this I, I had finished this Jack Kirby project, you know, huge project, a lot of time, a lot of energy, um, and and in a lot of ways like a culmination of a lot of you know things I'd been working on up to that point. Sure. And so it is. It was just kind of like, okay, what's next? Like, what do I do next? And um, like I just I was just playing. Like I'm just kind of like, and and this is how a lot of my projects develop. Is just kind of like. I don't know, I'm just gonna play and, and, and see what happens. So um, there are experiments, maybe there are experiments that won't become something or maybe the, uh, you know, the things that I try, I can apply to something else or maybe these things themselves will become something. But it was like, I, I, I did feel like after the Jack Kirby thing of like, okay, I gotta do something, uh, I gotta do something important. And like, that's a real creativity killer. Mm -hmm. Like when. You like when you go, in, oh, I gotta, I gotta make a big state. I gotta like save the world with my comics and that kind of thing. <laughs> nothing good come of that. So it was like, just like, let me just have some fun. Let me play around and and, you know, just play with yeah, with like superheroes and just kind of like fun stuff and 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 you know whatever and see what happens. And uh, you know, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. It's like, I keep hoping for it to like gel into something and become like the next big thing. Uh, but yeah, still, still just, just, just playing around and, and, you know, see where it goes. It's fun. Yeah. It, I mean, it also like I had a lot of sort of like baggage I had to get past. Like I, I, I did a, um, like a bunch of those superheroes and things were like characters. Uh, cause like I, I'd done all these, um, like, you know, like G.I. Joe, Transformers, Fantastic Four, like all these corporate things. And like, I, like those characters kind of had like some weight and meant something to me because, um, you know, they were things that I was like into from an early age. So there's all that nostalgia wrapped up. And then they also had like their own histories and stories. So there was like something to build on. It wasn't like, like starting from scratch. And just like looking through like some old notebooks and things from when I was a kid, I found like, you know, all these characters that I created when I was a kid and like that kind of stuff had like a similar, it like kind of hit similar, you know, sweet spots and, and, and like similar like nostalgia and they, they felt like they had their own history too. So that just seemed like an interesting thing, thing to build on. So, so like I started doing that. And then I also had um, like a bunch of scripts that I'd, created for like this book I was doing for DC called Superpowers. And then like that thing ended and I, I have like years worth of material um, and like that I'm really proud of and like nothing to, to do with it. So like some of those stories are like me like repurposing those, those super, cause again, it's like, you know, it's, it's kind of hard, hard to like move past that. Like when you like put a bunch of work into something and you're really proud of it and it's just never going to see the light of day. So it's like working through a lot of things and like comics uh you know and just like the world is kind of on hold at the moment i mean some people say oh no it's not you know things are still going on or whatever but like that's just kind of how it feels to me so it's like it's really hard to like make that like big next move at a time when like you don't you know you don't really know what's going on mm -hmm. well i think um so for me, I you know your your um, this book, and just your career in general is very inspiring. To uh, and I, I think that's gonna be very because I, I just feel like there's not very many people that have done it kind of like their way and have kind of taken this path to you know to the point where 
I'm not really even quite sure that you're at this point yet, but I, 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 what I envision is that it seems like you're able to kind of work on projects that you love now, you know, and, and like get paid for it. And I think that's like the dream, but you did it like kind of your way. And I think that's super inspiring. And I'm like, uh, I'm very happy that we got a chance to chat. Yeah. Rita, did you want to ask any um, Pittsburgh questions before we... Uh... Oh, no, I always feel like that's a token question I have to ask, but I, I do get excited. And when we were talking about the, uh, Ed and, and Jim, I, I do remember going back um, because when I, when I started doing comics again, I, I moved to the Bay Area and I found community there. But when I came back to visit, I think for a, a show, I think it was Pittsburgh Independent or Indie. Yeah, it was an indie comic yeah. show. And just seeing all of these... Um, comic artists, cartoonists, all in one place, but like different types of cartoonists, like, you know, the political comic strip cartoonists, you know, um, gag cartoonists, and, you know, newspaper cartoonists, and, and people just starting out, and, and you guys, and Bill Boyko, you know, from yeah. uh, uh, Copacetic Comics um, Shop, and Frank Santora, like, they all were just very there were like no factions like it was just this wonderful beautiful community that everyone was totally whatever type of cartoonist or whatever level or whatever skill set just very very welcoming and i that was like the, the one and, and also rachel i forgot yeah um um just everyone knew each other and everyone was so welcoming and that just just blew me away and so that's what i always think of you know pittsburgh cartoonists I mean, Tom still knows me from like the last, <laughs> we haven't seen each other for a while, so yeah. he remembers me. So just, just seeing that, um, and then like going, I think they like going to like monthly like lunches or like getting mm -hmm. hot dogs together, like, that, like that's amazing. Like Wayno, you know, who does, you know, mm -hmm. the, yeah. the Bizarro Strip, like, um, it's, it's great. And um, I'm just glad that there's a great comics community there. It almost makes me want to go back and live there. And um, I, but I'm afraid of winters and extreme mm -hmm. weather. Um, but you yeah, can't have like, her back. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I wondered, like, like, you know, you we don't leave. Someplace, someplace cool, like someplace, you know, hip and, yeah. and someplace, like, something's happening. I love it. Exactly. I left, I left and then it got cool. And I was like, is it because right. I left? Like, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but, left the Bay Area and then it gets cool. <laughs> yeah. But I'm really excited. I'm excited about the whole the comic scene in Pittsburgh. I'm excited about you guys, you know, kind of revolutionizing how we see, how, how, how it's cool now to like see like these old comics and like, you know, bringing them into, you know, the modern age and, and, and also making them your own um and telling your stories through them i think it's really cool so very very happy to have you on yeah awesome. finally uh, tom before we go what's next for you what was there anything coming out uh um publishing wise or should be yeah, I mean, on your instagram yeah this yeah was tell us your instagram first my my instagram is tom underscore shioli and then uh my twitter is at Tom Scioli. Um, and yeah, that's, that's basically like where I'm at right now. Like I, I didn't have a plan beyond this book. And oh. then I, you know, I couldn't even imagine a world after this book. And then I finished yeah. and I needed some time off. Like I was exhausted and I took some time off and then like the whole world took some time off. So, <laughs> so perfect. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you yeah. could, you deserve it though. Like, I, I, I mean, I, I'm sure you have, I'm sure you have plenty left in you but this is definitely like one of those like kind of works of a lifetime i would say like it's mm -hmm. it does feel like monumental like that yeah and i hope that 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 you know the world taking a break doesn't uh stop people from picking this up because i think this is uh amazing the yeah. comic book store i went i got this at had like a whole pile of them and uh and we were buying them so i was like oh okay I, I'm, I'm glad that people are starting to pick it up and, and comic stores are supporting it and stuff so so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, everybody's, you know, stuck at home and, and, you know, like reading is kind of having, you know, like a renaissance. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it's true. Well, it was nice to see you, Tom. Thank you so Thanks, much for doing Tom. this show. Hopefully we'll keep in touch. And uh, Hopefully we'll be at like a convention together. Yeah, someday, yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks, Tom. <laughs>